it's very hard in terms of your feeling of uh, you know your ego and 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 how you can feel good about what you do to accept the idea that what you've been working on for decades might be actually very dangerous for humanity. In a 1955 paper titled "The Computer in the Brain," John von Neumann wrote that the possibility of replacing the human brain by a machine, which will be superior to it in any or all respects is not excluded by any natural law that we know. It's therefore possible that the human race may be extinguished by machines. Von Neumann's warning has since been echoed by many other AI experts, from Stephen Hawking to Elon Musk. The concern captured the public imagination earlier this year when the Future of Life Institute issued a letter calling for a six-month moratorium on large language model development, saying that the development of artificial general intelligence could lead to human extinction. Then in May, the Center for AI Safety issued a statement warning that the development of artificial general intelligence could pose an existential risk to humanity. Many who had not signed the Future of Life letter signed this one, including Jeff Hinton and OpenAI CEO Sam Altman. Yashua Bengio, who signed the Future of Life letter, had spoken on this podcast before about the threat, but I spoke to him again specifically about the extinction threat, whether it's a useful characterization or simply adding anxiety to a generation already troubled by looming existential threats such as climate change. Sir. Just a moment. Sir. Yes. I apologize for interrupting you, but I wanted to remind you that Oracle is offering a full implementation okay. of NetSuite. Yeah, thank, thanks for reminding me. Please continue. Yeah. Okay, you can go back to your station. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, 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 Beauregard reminds me that the first time in NetSuite's 22 years as the number one cloud financial system, you can defer payments on a full Im implementation for six months. That's no payment, no interest for six months. To take advantage of this unprecedented offer, go to netsuite.com backslash ionai. That's www.netsuite.com backslash I on AI, E Y E O N A I, all run together. Now, here's Yashua. Hey, Yashua. I wanted to talk to you about the, uh, your, your essay on how an AI could become rogue. Uh, and since then, this uh, extinction debate has ramped up. I, I, on my Twitter feed, uh, there was a long thread uh, by somebody with a blue check mark. Uh, that doesn't mean much anymore, but uh, basically bemoaning, uh, you know, the generation we've already destroyed uh, because extinction is inevitable uh, now that we've developed these uh, these language models. Uh, and and that just I mean it just to me that that debate uh, which is bleeding into the general uh, public discourse has gotten out of hand. But uh, you know your your essay was really the first concrete response I've seen on how things could go wrong. Uh, so I, I wanted first for you to just present that scenario and then i'll ask some questions um i don't know if i told you last time but i'm also writing a, another blog post which um lists pretty much all the um pros and cons of that discussion that i've heard so yeah the, let me summarize the debate in the way that max stegmark did it near the end um so he said, um, Yashua, no, we, we are uh, on a river and you know, going down the river and on our collective boat. 
and Joshua hears uh, some waterfalls downstream. Um, and Melanie says, there is no waterfall. Or, you know, if there is one, it's going to be maybe in 300 years. So we shouldn't worry. And Jan says, um, yeah, of course, there's a waterfall. We all agree on it's about, you know, uh, a few years to a few decades away. Uh, but we'll figure it out when we get there. So that's like a high level kind of description of each one's positions. Um, Max also talked about some existential risks that I haven't been like really covering myself or uh, you know, talking about in, in what I wrote uh, that has to do with a slow um, disempowerment as we get more and more dependent on AI and the AI builds up its power at some point, um, it becomes very, very hard to pull the plug, even if we could, um, because we're completely dependent on it. And it, you know, the society would break down and, and yeah. So, so that's another kind of scenario, which is a sort of, a interesting to think of. And some people in the AI safety have been also thinking about, uh, but I've been mostly talking about the simpler scenarios that I talked about in the rogue AI uh, essay. So the very, very simplest one uh, doesn't even require like some very fancy knowledge of uh, machine learning or anything or reinforcement learning or AI safety. It's just that it just assumes that in the near future, which as I said, there's a lot of uncertainty, like is it years or decades? Um, we, we know how to build a superhuman AI. And if that recipe is publicly available, and even worse, if the, the weights of a trained AI uh, are available, then it becomes very easy for a huge number of people um, to issue instructions that if they were executed by the AI could lead, you know, terrible catastrophes. And in the worst case could lead extinction. And, and I, you know, I, I can explain maybe with some scenarios what that means. Yeah. So, so th that's, um, I feel like I, I haven't heard any like serious criticism of that. I mean, maybe the, the strongest um, counter argument is Jan saying, oh, don't worry, we'll build, we'll use uh, the progress in AI in order to build um, counter, uh, you know, measures AI that are going to help us uh, fight off the rogue AIs. And because there will be more good AIs than bad AIs, you know, the good guys will win. Um, maybe, and I think we should definitely do that. In fact, I, I'd like to work on something like this, but I don't think it's a silver bullet. We know in kind of military situations or conflicts that you know, sometimes the attacker has an advantage uh, because the attacker can do things silently. Um, and sometimes there is not a lot of time to react or to prevent, uh, you know, some large amount of damage. Then I talked about the, what I call the, what I now call the Frankenstein scenario. So. So there, there is the sort of a naive scenario where somebody naive, but, but, but also, but plausible where somebody just out of anger or, uh, you know, uh, conspiracy theory, you know, crazy beliefs or for military reasons issues, these highly destructive instructions, um, a slightly, um, kind of less obvious, but, but, but also fairly likely scenario in, uh, that enlarges the set of people who would do this is someone issues uh, instructions or, you know, designs the AI so that it would have its own self-preservation instinct. In other words, one of its main goals is to survive just like us and every other living being, which essentially means we 
end up with a new species on Earth, a new species that would be smarter than us. And, you know, the past of more powerful or smarter species um, uh, acting in ways that have driven to extinction other weaker, less smart species isn't very reassuring. Just in the last few hundred years, um, humans have driven almost a thousand species to extinction. That's the ones that are, you know, that we know about. And that's not to mention our cousins, hominids, uh, that have all disappeared. We don't know why, but, you know, uh, it'd be surprising if, if uh, Homo sapiens didn't have a role in this. And, and when we drive a species to extinction, it's not necessarily that we want to destroy them. It's just that they are like a, their destruction or their disempowerment uh, is a side effect of us trying to achieve our goal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we want more land, more profit, more food. And that's mostly the way that we've driven a lot of species to extinction. Or some species still exist, but they're completely disempowered. So gorillas are still there. We're probably going to keep them around. But how much agency do they have, you know, um, over their environment? It's all controlled by us. Um, I don't think humans want something like this for, for Homo sapiens. Yeah. Can I just interrupt for a minute? Because uh, the, the yeah. certainly these scenarios have been... Uh, in the public space and in science fiction uh, uh, novels and, and movies uh, for decades. Uh, what happened that, that uh, and, and certainly you've acknowledged uh, sort of distant risks in the past, people have talked about it, but the consensus by you and Jeff Hinton and others was that that is so remote we don't have to worry about it right now. There was yeah. this dramatic uh, uh, step function, you know, where things uh, in, progressed very quickly with the transformer algorithm. Uh, but w why now? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, that that generative AI certainly there are abuses uh, in the current. Uh, uh, current level of technology uh, that are possible through different disinformation and that sort of thing, or if they're hooked up uh, to the internet, you know, you could construct scenarios where they could do do damage to uh, to things that are are available through the internet. But uh, but wh why did you suddenly decide that this threat is? near term enough that we need to, to act on it. Um, uh, in, in a few words, we, we've reached the stage of essentially passing the Turing test, meaning that, uh, it's hard to distinguish if you're talking to a human or a machine, if, if you're exchanging with GPT-4, I mean, and. Right now, if you ask it, it will tell you that it is a machine, but, but it could easily be the case that it doesn't do that. So that was, of course, thought by Alan Turing himself um, uh, many, many decades ago at the beginning of computer science that as a way to evaluate whether we've reached human level intelligence. Now, I don't think we have, because if you take much more time to, uh, Kind of try to uh, trap GPT-4. You can find some issues, and but there are like I don't know hundreds of billions of dollars invested to fix those issues because GPT-4 and you know ChatGPT have been working so well. Uh, and in fact, the work that I've been doing for many years is all about fixing those issues. It's adding the system to capabilities to deep learning. And right now, deep learning is very good at system one capabilities, which roughly correspond to intuitive, immediate reaction, you know, behavior that you do without taking the time to think about it. And that require a lot of practice in order to hone in. System two allows us to do things where we don't even need a lot of data. We can just think through, reason our way 
to find solutions to problems. And we have a sense of whether some statement is, is true or not. Um, and, and we can reason with causality and things like this. But there's been progress on system two uh, and other issues that people are working on. Um, it's hard to say if we, you know, maybe we're close to a breakthrough on, on, on these aspects, maybe just two, three years, or maybe it's 20 years. Uh, there may be other obstacles we don't see right now, but, but from my vantage point, I'm very concerned that we're not very far. And I also know that society takes a lot of time to adapt, to come up with countermeasures, uh, regulation, international treaties, everything that I need, I think will be necessary in order to reduce those risks. And finally, you might have, you know, you asked me like, why now? Why didn't I like think about it before? Why didn't Jeff think about it before? Well, so we thought it was so far away, we didn't need to worry. Um, but also there, I believe there's a psychological effect, which might be still at play for a lot of people. It's very hard um, in terms of your um, feeling of, uh, you know, your ego and, and, and how you can feel good about what you do to accept the idea that what you've been working on for decades might be actually very dangerous for humanity because there are people who have been working on AI safety for you know at least a decade and others longer but uh, mostly it's been in the last decade a lot of work has been done I mean it's very very marginal in the machine learning community but still there are people who have been worried for for, for some times and they've been writing papers to try to think about the different scenarios and countermeasures and so on um, People like Stuart Russell, for example, who wrote a very nice book, uh, Human Compatible, about that and how we might potentially build safe AI systems. So um, I think that I didn't want to like think too much about it. And it's probably the case for others. Uh, you were saying uh, that you could walk us through uh, the extinction event, and it's really the word extinction that that bothers me. As I said on Twitter, they're, they're, they're apparently credible people who are already sort of bemoaning uh, the extinction of the human race because it's too late uh, to stop this development. Uh, and and when that gets into the public, uh, it 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 just spreads fear and yeah. you know there are a lot of this wonderful is, this things. This is bad for sure. Yeah, and there are a lot of wonderful things that AI can do. I mean, in terms of extinction events, you and I have talked about this. We are facing an extinction event with climate change. Very little Absolutely. doubt. Uh, those, uh, the, the, the systems that contribute to climate change are so complex. We need the, the pattern recognition capabilities of AI. We need the reasoning capabilities of uh, generative AI to, to help solve those problems. So from my point of view, it's, it, AI is probably our best hope. Uh, yeah. to, to avoid extinction. But when you tie AI to extinction, uh, you know, yes, it, it seems to have woken the regulators up, uh, but it, it, it creates a very uh, a strong headwind for, uh, for, for a, the positive uses of AI. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm totally with you on this. Um, I would just like us to be wise and walk this fine line where we can get the benefits or at least a large number of them, but avoid the catastrophic outcomes. So yeah. I'm not saying it's going to be easy and just like uh, being submerged by fear isn't going to help either. Um, Here's the thing about desperation. I don't think that we're cooked. Um, let me take the, the climate change analogy. Um, climate activists 
could feel desperate and just drop it, drop the ball, but they don't. We should have acted 20 or 30 years ago. We, we did it, but now we are today. What can we do to move things in the right direction? And there's, you know, until we, 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 we have agency, which we do right now, it is possible to reduce those risks. Um, that, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and yeah, we have to be careful not to create a panic, but, but trying to steer something positive uh, that, that is going to help on both sides. Uh, there's there's this concern about super intelligence uh, right now uh, what we're dealing with uh, is a, a system that uh, by ingesting massive amounts of data has learned to predict predict the next token in a series essentially when applied to language that it predicts the next word there's there's no a deeper intelligence uh, there. Uh, there may be uh, the illusion of, uh, of even sentience, but you're involved in building these systems uh, and you know that there, there is no, uh, uh, no ghost intelligent. In the what's that? Yeah. There's no ghost in the machine. Thank you. Uh, and the idea that that we will arrive at the point where we can build that, uh, no one knows how to do that. Uh, there's certainly uh, people trying. It just seems the scaling up of transformer models uh, was uh, surprised everybody at, at, at what the system could do. But that's still a, a huge leap from building a machine that has uh, an independent intelligence uh, and agency. So, uh, no, actually not. So, you know, <clears throat> um, auto GPT showed you can take chat GPT and create a thin layer around it, a wrapper that provides it with agency, for example, to act on the internet. Mm -hmm. And you say that, that, you know, there's a huge gap. Well, how do you know? I, I don't see that. I see that it could be a short while. I don't know for sure. And, and because I'm not sure, I don't want to like take the risk that, oh, let's, you know, ignore the potential problem. Yeah. Um, also, there is no ghost in the machine in your brain either, as far as I know. Yeah, but there are many, um, many, many more structures in my brain and in your brain yes. than a neural net. Yes, that's true. That's true. But uh, it looks like so the kind of intelligence we're gradually building is not a copy of our brain. Right. You know, evolution has come up with our design through many torturous uh, turns. It's not clear that, you know, you need uh, that, that it's the only solution to intelligence. Um, personally, I think that we've solved a large part of the problem and you know system two is something that came fairly late the scale of evolution um we're not sure of course but but it, you know it looks like uh, something that might not require that many bits of information that's been added on top of the all the things in evolution have found before so that means we may not be that far and we have already some plans to to deal with that what in your research, I saw recently, you said that you're going to shift your research to safety. Uh, what in your research uh, are you are you abandoning that uh, that would lead toward more powerful AI? 
what I would like to avoid right now is to <clears throat> put out information that's publicly available um, that would help to bridge that, that gap that remains too quickly. I will continue my projects in AI for Social Good, uh, which is about very specialized systems that, that you know don't understand how society and humans work, but maybe some very small part of it. Um, and and like I need to take the time to think about more precisely what is my best course of action. The uh, you 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 talked in the the uh, paper uh, on on how a rogue AI could arise about open source and the danger of open source, uh, and and you talked about uh, you know genocidal humans getting a hold of an AI and and doing right. uh, something destructive with it uh, yeah, on yeah. Uh, in. In both of those cases, even with open source code, you need at least today a, a tremendous uh, financial resources uh, to marshal the hardware. No. No. Well, you, you don't need to marshal the hardware yourself. You're right, it's available through the cloud, but you still need to pay for it. And no, no, if, if, you, if, the, if the weights are shared, then it's very cheap to, um, you know, fine tune it, put the layers you want around it, so that it's going to be specialized to the task you want, which may be some, some malicious objective or some nefarious objective. So you're saying if there's an open source, pre-trained model, yes, that you yes. can copy the weights. Uh... That's already the case. So I mean, but not not with, you know. Uh, superhuman AI, but it's already what what essentially Facebook has done with with uh, open sourcing uh, models. Yes, including yeah. the weights. Yeah, and then on the agency side, uh, you have these wrappers like Auto GPT that that do give uh, these agency. large language models access to the internet. However. Goals. <laughs> And, and goals, right? They turn them into goal-directed uh, AI systems. Yeah. Although I, I've played around with AutoGPT. We talked about that last yes. time. And it's it's not as straightforward. But uh, that's not the point. The point is that, in, I mean, people who know about reinforcement learning know that it's easy to design something like this. Now, the, the reason it's not working that great is because AutoGPT itself, I mean, uh, ChatGPT itself is not that smart. But what about two, three, five, ten years from now? Yeah. Uh, the uh, You also, uh, in your paper, and I appreciated this, talking about uh, corporations as a form of artificial intelligence that that uh, you know do a lot of bad things in the interest of a goal that's not aligned with uh, society. Uh, uh, so a lot of this, when you say work on safety, are you talking about uh, working on on the so-called alignment problem? How you instill uh, human aligned values and goals and prevent um, that's one way so the other way that i've been talking about is to try to design um, ai systems that don't have agency by construction um, now uh, and, and and are trained not to please us like my current chat gpt um, but to be truthful in a probabilistic sense, uh, to understand how the world works, and then to answer our questions based on this knowledge. Um, now, these could still be turned into agents in the same way that you know, AutoGPT works. So you, you need some other defenses. And, and I think with the combination of both like technical aspects 
and uh, societal aspects, like you know, who has access, what kind of governance do you put around these things, um, who decides what we do with this, and and so on. Um, I think we can considerably reduce the risks. Um, the EU has passed its, uh, though not passed, but uh, the, the Parliament has submitted its first draft of its AI Act. Uh, Canada, I'm not sure where they are in the process, but are close to doing the same. Uh, do you think these regulatory efforts answer your concerns? Mm, they're a step in the right direction, but they haven't been designed for uh, yeah, catastrophic risks. So can you walk us through uh, a, an extinction, extinction scenario? I mean, that's what what everyone's a little uh, alarmed about, a little, uh, right. when, when people like you talk about extinction. Uh, so if you could just give kind of one scenario of how that could happen and uh, understanding that, as you called it, there's still a gap between uh, the AI that we have today and, and the AI that would pose that sort of a challenge? Mm. One scenario um, that that I think about is the this Frankenstein scenario where, you know, we, we have a tendency to, to want to build AI at our image. And in fact, a lot of people today think this is the right thing to do. Problem is, um, if we do that, it means we are giving these machines the same kind of uh, self-preservation instinct um, that other, you know, that every animal has. And with that come as a uh, important sub goal, if you want to uh, survive, you, first of all, you don't want to be turned off. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. So um, if we ever have the intention of turning one of these systems off and it, it understands that, it's going to do its best to prevent us. So you can see already a conflict here. Um, also, uh, the best way to survive is to uh, figure out how to control your environment. I mean, all animals do that to the extent they can. But now we're talking about an entity that is smarter than us. So we are part of its environment. That means it wants to control us. Yeah, but 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 we're not talking about embodied intelligence. There's no physical manifestation. Well, that 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 comes easily. So first, the kind of systems we're building now and we know how to build uh, probably for the next few years. You're right. Don't have a body. They have actions, though, in the real world, which are, the, for example, the dialogues or the images or the videos that they can produce. And potentially, if somebody connects them to the internet, all the things you could do on the internet. Um, so how could they um, you know, do something in the, in, in the, in the non-virtual world? Well, they can convince, they can manipulate people they can pay them for doing some things. You know, this is you, you go on some websites and you ask people to, to do things legally. Um, or you can pay them to do illegal things, like organized crime is happy to do things without asking where the money comes from. And <clears throat> these different uh, people can be contributing to a, you know, a bigger project and looking at their piece doesn't seem so terrible. Right. Um, at some point, you could imagine that these systems will be able to design robots that are you know, better than the ones we have, and then have their own body as well. I mean, it's not the same thing as our body because we, you know, if our body goes away, we are, we are finished, but, but these systems can, reproduce themselves they, you know if, if if one body dies it's all right they, they're you know copies of the code in many places um, in a way they are immortal unlike us 
you know, our bo body is going to eventually uh, not be functional anymore. Um, they can copy themselves as, as, as many times as necessary. Um, so the, 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 yeah, that's the kind of scenario by which they can take control. Now, how could that lead to, you know, what kind of actions could they do? People have been talking about two main vectors and maybe they'll think of something else. One is, uh, bioweapons and the other is cybersecurity attacks. And by the way, with cybersecurity, you could gain control of, uh, things that, that have an importance in the real world, like uh, your energy infrastructure or weapons, bringing down our uh, communications infrastructure, you know, combined with other things could, could be terrible. So for example, if you combine that sort of thing with uh, the release of a bioweapon, in other words, new pathogen, that would be more virulent and viral than anything you know, we already know, <clears throat> It's quite conceivable. There's already research going on to use AI to better understand how our cells work. And I think this could be an extremely positive revolution, but it also means that we might, you know, reach a point where AI systems could design new living beings, you know, starting with the viruses that, that could either help us a lot or harm us a lot. Yeah, uh, so it's it's really an issue of uh, agency, of whether or not we allow these systems to have agency. As you pointed out, there are already these wrappers of on uh, on GitHub that uh, that are giving uh, GPT four agency. Uh, although, as I said, it really doesn't work because GPT four hallucinates. And auto GPT just compounds the hallucination, and next thing you know, you're stuck in some endless loop where the thing crashes. Uh, but as you said, that you know it's early days; those those problems will be addressed. Uh, so, would this mean, uh, on the regulatory side, outlawing, uh, allowing these uh, systems to to have a, a live connection to the air, internet i mean uh maintaining them as uh, air gapped systems is that the solution or or do you think it's more about uh just re regulating uh the, the the systems themselves i mean how large they can be or how capable they can be so first of all, you know, I've just started thinking about these questions. I, I don't feel like I have all the answers at all. I, I think we need uh, as a priority to spend more of our brain cycles to study these questions, um, both on the side of AI safety, like the computer science side and on the policy side. But it seems reasonable to uh, consider some forms of open source and, and sharing of, of models uh, to be something we want to limit when when these systems are dangerous right? or potentially dangerous, of course. Um, but most of what we do in AI right now is is, is, is not dangerous at all. Right? So we're talking about systems that don't exist yet, but we don't want them to be too easily accessible. Although the flip side of that as, I mean, you, we've, you, you've been through all these arguments endless times at this point, but the flip side of that is, is you have a, a, a small group of people holding uh, tremendous power. And that was the argument behind setting up OpenAI in the first place, ironically, uh, was because Google uh, had, had, you know, this proprietary tech that was extremely powerful and there was a thought that it should be open sourced. Uh, but of course, OpenAI then came up with extremely powerful tech and and closed it as well. So, uh, yeah, what do you say to that argument that, that you're then concentrating me? Who gets to decide who yes. controls it? It's just the... 
whoever has the most money to hire the most engineers. No, well, not necessarily. Um, we could set up governance systems by which these organizations work for the public. Um, so <clears throat> concentration of power is something that's already happening and that we want to avoid. Absolutely, I agree. So we have to find ways to be safe and preserve democracy because democracy is all about you know not concentration of power. How can we do that? Um, <clears throat> so one one thing I've thought about, and several people have talked about, you know, a CERN of AI. So the idea is, actually, I think there should be several, but to have organizations that are nonprofit. Um, and under very strict um, governance to make sure that uh, we avoid the arms race between companies or between countries that is going to happen if we do nothing. Um, so it's not just concentration of power, it's also the arms race. In other words, companies or countries competing with each other and cutting corners, which could be dangerous from a safety point of view. Now, <clears throat> you know, there nothing is easy and, and you know, I'm not sure uh, if governments will be eventually convinced that this is uh, the right path, but that, that's my opinion. So what I mean by this kind of governance is that to avoid the arms race, um, it would be something in which the you know as, as large a coalition of countries as possible and especially those that are uh, opposed to each other like the us china and russia are part of that governance and and the, po the, the so that <clears throat> what is going to be done without ai is going to be um managed so that it's not targeted at um you know, hurting some other country or something like that. Um, yeah, and and I think that if we allow these kinds of super powerful AI to go on in companies, they would also have to uh, obey very severe protocols of safety. Yeah, with with people like you and Jeff uh, peeling off from uh, the the basic research uh do you think on the one hand that uh that progress toward agi or toward the this uh, super intelligence that that we're concerned about will slow or do you think uh, that the, the, there'll be a parallel track where uh, we're working on safety and guardrails and uh, policy and regulation and on the other track there's you know yen lacoon is not slowing down on his world model efforts right <clears throat> i think it's going to be parallel tracks for a while um i um i think that even if jeff and i didn't contribute to the public advances um in, in ai there are so many people working on this, so much money invested that, you know, we're going to continue to move forward. <clears throat> but, and that's exactly the reason why I think we need these um, tightly um, governed organizations that will build, uh, hopefully, the first uh, superhuman AI, but in a safe way that can help us mitigate potential attacks from rogue AIs coming from the uncontrolled efforts. Yeah. But, uh, but really, these are all speculations, right? I think it's very early right now. I'm just like drawing these as potential scenarios. I think more people need to think about it and exchange and um, these scenarios need to be evaluated and discussed uh, across many stakeholders. Yeah, I, I saw uh, Andrew uh, had a conversation with Jeff Hinton, uh, and and one of the things they said is that 
right now the AI community uh, is divided on this question. Uh, and in certain quarters, as I referenced on, on Twitter, uh, that debate is becoming uh, pretty heated, uh, pretty angry. Uh, and, and what needs to happen is the two sides uh, within the research community need to, to, to come up with a consensus view uh, because otherwise it leaves uh, the public and, and presumably regulators confused, uh, you know, who do they listen to? Yeah, it would be nice. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, there, there's always been issues that divide scientists on which policy have to take decisions. Think about climate tobacco for a while at least um, the, the way that I think about this if I was you know um, uh, in government is that there are scientists who think this is a very dangerous issue there are scientists who think we should not worry about it we don't know who's right but the stakes are high if we ignore the problem and it turns out you know the, the concerned one we're right so so i think we need to apply the you know cautionary principle here as a society right now that means regulation uh are you working with the canadian regulators or with any uh of uh with the eu on uh or the us for that matter on on advising on on regulations or legislation well i've mostly been working with the canadian government but i've been talking to um senators in the u.s as well yeah and uh so you're just to sum up uh you know we don't know how distant this threat is but uh the threshold of of capability has been reached where it's time you think to start working seriously on these problems uh but without scaring the public about imminent extinction which i think is what's creeping into the public discourse yeah it's not clear how to do that yeah i mean the strategy um the way I try to present things is not to focus on extinction risk, but just catastrophic risk, which is already bad enough. Think about nuclear weapons. I mean, the most part they're used will survive, but uh, very badly. Yeah. Climate is likely like this as well. We'll probably adapt, but society could be badly destroyed. Many people could suffer and die. That's it for this episode. I want to thank Joshua for his time. If you want to read a transcript of this conversation, you can find one, as always, on our website. That's www.eye-on.ai. And, and remember, I don't think the singularity is near. But AI is changing your world, so you better pay attention.